Hello and welcome back to ABE 474 Indoor Environmental Control. Um, we are picking up with Chapter 6, Space Heating Load. This is the second section, uh, the section, second part within the section for Chapter 6. Um, and we are starting with estimating infiltration. So we just talked about there are two methods for estimating infiltration. Let's take a quick look at both of those. So the first one is the air change method. And in this method, um, we have um, an equation here where uh, V, so, so ACH air changes per hour times V over C sub T. So where V is our gross, so this is a volume, uh, gross space volume. And it can either be in cubic feet or cubic meters. Um, ACH, we've seen before, air changes per hour. And it is, the units on it are one per hour, regardless of which system you're in. And then C sub T is a constant. And if we are working in IP, that constant is 60. If we were working in SI, the constant is 3,600. Um, the units on Q, on our uh, flow rate, our estimate for infiltration, are in um, volumetric flow rates. So for um, IP system, we're at CFM. And SI system, we're in meters cubed per second. Um, and it's that simple. Um, Yeah, so that's the air change method. Um, if we want to move on and talk a little bit about um, the crack method. We also have an equation that has to do with the flow rate. And you're going to want to refer to figure 6-1 for uh, the uh, coefficients that are uh, appearing in this equation. But A is the effective leakage area of the cracks. which has to be estimated um, and the uh, cracks that we're talking about here are typically along the, the um, places where you have windows and doors installed so you have some length of crack associated um, with uh, essentially a gap that is um, uh, inevitable and when you put together um, two pieces of dissimilar materials so when you install your doors and install your windows you can end up with cracks and also if for example your doors open um, and there's the gap down the middle um, so for example uh, buildings that have double doors that you come into there's a, there's a gap down the middle between those two doors um, and so that all adds up to this effective leakage area of the cracks um, C is a flow coefficient that depends on uh, the type of cracks that you have and the nature of flow of the crack. So while you have an opening, not all openings are created equal and not all allow air to pass the same. And so you have some amount of area and then you have some characteristics of uh, that area that um, allow air to pass more or less easily. So delta P is the pressure differential. Just 
the difference in inside and outside pressure. And then N also depends on the nature of flow in the crack. And this value might um, range between and uh, the value might range between 0.4 and 1. Um, as you can see, both of these methods are going to be related to um, estimating uh, the amount of flow that is coming into the building um, and in order to refine these methods, we need some experimental data on some uh, real, okay, real systems to, to make these estimates better. Um, and that's okay. This is, you know, they exist because they're one way to do it. Um, and, but we need to make sure that we're using values that have been uh, generated from systems that are as, as representative of our system as possible. So we said a lot about the driving force that is uh, facilitating this infiltration being a differential pressure between the inside and outside. Um, and we're going to take a few minutes and look at what is generating or what is creating that pressure differential and it's composed potentially of a variety of different um, sources if you will of uh, pressure so wind pressure is one option stack pressure so stack effect and then any effects of our ventilation system, so building pressurization. All right, and we're gonna break it down and take a look at each of these. So, wind pressure results from either an increase or decrease in air velocity outside the building. Okay, and so this wind pressure, T sub T, is going to be theoretical. So in theory, it should be related to um, explainable by Bernoulli's law where the row here is the density of our air. This G sub C is a dimensional constant, uh, which is discussed um, in page XV in your book. Or prefix 15. Um, but so it's not discussed in the chapters, but you can find a discussion of this dimensional constant in your book. Uh, dimensional, yeah, dimensional constant. Uh, in previous classes, we've had some discussion about where this number came from and um, why it exists and why it's necessary. But take a look, and it, it mostly is related to uh, which system of units you're in, whether you need it or not, and what its value is. Um, velocity of the wind okay. and the velocity of the wind at the building boundary. Uh, 
Um, and so we make an assumption about this velocity of the wind at the building boundary. We assume that once the uh, wind hits the building, it stops moving. So just at the boundary, we assume that the wind is not moving at the boundary. So it slows down as it, you know, it's either going to go around the building or it's going to stop because it's not going to go through the building. So that velocity at the building boundary has to be zero. Um, but in reality, there's still some air moving and uh, so this is an assumption and the, the way this has been uh, addressed is to create a correction factor. And the air doesn't just go and then hit the brakes and stop, so there's s some uh, com complexity there. And so instead of trying to come up with uh, an equation to explain that, cur that uh, uh, complexity, we just create a correction factor to go from what we think it should be to what it actually is. And again, everything we're doing is an estimate. Uh, to get us close, to get us close enough that we can size equipment. So using these methods we're not going to create any elaborate models that give us exactly the uh, the value that we want. We're getting close enough that we can size equipment. And then this C sub P is a pressure coefficient that depends on the shape and the orientation of the building with respect to the wind. And in your book, you're going to refer to figure 6-2 and figure 6-3 and 6-4. So figure 6-2 is for low-rise buildings, so for short buildings. And figures 6-3 and 6-4 are for high-rise buildings. I'm going to slide that up because I know there's an image over that. There you go. So the correction factor equation is just the relationship between um, the pressure that it actually is and the uh, theoretical pressure, and that is a uh, that ratio is a coefficient that depends on the shape and the orientation of the building with respect to the wind. And in class, we'll work an example uh, doing this, so um, you can have a look at it. Um, just an extra note, kind of about that theoretical pressure. So the I'll go back up here where we went. I'll pull this down so you can see it all. Okay. Theoretical pressure differential uh, for uh, still not get that for this equation here. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. It's the computed pressure difference. When our assumption is true, okay, um, and then this is what we'll end up solving for. So we can get this from our table, we can get this from our uh, computation, and then we can get this uh, from uh, is what we're we're actually looking for. Is we want the actual pressure pressure differential. And so taking a look at that. we end up with this equation. So we substitute in zero for our boundary condition and we bring in our coefficient in order to correct and go from theoretical to actual. Okay. There we go. 
Okay, so that is wind pressure. Now let's take a look at what we call the stack effect so that we can look at our stack pressure. All right, so if this is our building and um, we have to have a, a, a building that is an, tall enough to have a stack effect. So typically stack effect is uh, more prominent in buildings that are taller. Um, we are going to, within our building, have differences in pressure along the height of the building due to the buoyancy of the air inside the building. Okay, so There's some warm air buoyancy that is essentially um, making the air want to rise, okay? And so as that happens, um, it creates this effect that brings air in near the bottom, uh, rise through the building, and then exit through the top. Um, at least in winter, low outdoor temperature conditions. Okay, um, somewhere within the building we have what's called a neutral pressure level. In most cases it's somewhere roughly in the middle of the building, but um, it isn't uh, required to be exactly at the middle of the building. Um, so if we want to estimate our stack pressure, and again, we're going to start with the theoretical. And first we'll write out the equation, then we'll look at each of the terms. Okay, so this piece of O is our outside pressure. This equation also holds true for both uh, metric and English units. The H, so this is not our convective heat transfer coefficient. This is a different H. So H is the vertical distance from this neutral pressure level. R here is the gas constant for air. This G over G sub C is a, a ratio that is related to gravity. And as I mentioned before, um, you can look up and kind of see a little bit of it, but it's related to the two unit systems uh, being different from one another. And, and um, depending on which unit system you're working in is what value you need to use in there. Um, and then the TO and TI are the absolute temperatures for indoor and outdoor. All right, and this theoretical stack pressure makes some assumptions. So um, if this equation is perfect, we don't have any separations in this building due to the floors. So obviously that uh, has some implications as an assumption. So no separations due to floor, so it's a completely open building. Floors and stairwells, uh, elevators, etc. So depending on the um, contents and the, the arrangement of your building, um, you're obviously going to have to do some sort of a correction uh, to this theoretical um, calculation. All right. 
So let's take a look at um, kind of a, a sketch to kind of visualize what it is that we're talking about. So let's go for a decently tall building here that we can do some sketching inside of. Um, so if you have an elevator in the building, you do typically have an opening that goes completely from floor to ceiling. So we're going to show this as our elevator shaft. Um, and then somewhere in the building, you also typically have a stairwell. And if you're in a building this tall, you hope it has an elevator. Um, but stairwells may or may not be completely open to the top. Um, and then the building itself is going to have floors. And um, in this building, we're just going to show four. So P1, P2, P3, and P4. And you made an assumption that regardless of where in the building you are, um, the R will be the same. Okay? So if we just take a look at this, R being resistance, um, adding the floors offers some resistance to vertical airflow. I'm going to call that our R. This R can be made to vary depending on how you seal off the stairways. and you need a correction factor. To relate your stack pressure to your theoretical stack pressure. And it is shown by a C sub D, much like we saw the correction factor for when. It looks very similar. Um, And so if we take a look at our, um, so if we come back over here again and say, okay, so if floor one, floor two, floor three, and floor four are all similar to one another, and my sketch is not very much to scale because this one should be the same as that one, um, then the resistance within each one of these is the same. And then depending on what's happening with the stairwells and the elevator, it could be um, changed up a little bit. But assuming that all things are equal and it's just divided four times, um, you're still going to have movement of air from floor to floor because you're going to have the stack effect that we talked about. Um, and so because we have that air moving, um, actually, because of the pressure differential, the air is going to move. But the pressure differential looks something like this. So pressure at 4 is going to be less than the pressure at 3. It's going to be less than the pressure at 2. It's going to be less than the pressure at 1. Okay. Um, and so when we come over here to take a look at this correction coefficient, we know that our ratio of stack pressure to theoretical stack pressure uh, is our stack pressure is less than our theoretical stack pressure and so this coefficient must always be less than one okay? so that's something that we know about this coefficient 
And then if we want to apply this coefficient as we did with the wind coefficient in order to get a uh, stack pressure, then we need to go back and uh, slightly manipulate our equation from earlier. And in order to apply this equation, you're going to want to take a look at figure 6-5 in your textbook uh, to help you out with that coefficient. All right, and then the last type of pressure we want to look at is uh, pressurization of our building. So for example, if we have our you know, building space, you have some volume of air coming in and some volume of air being exhausted. And if you are bringing in, well, if you are forcing it in with a fan here, then the building is going to be pressurized and it's going to exhaust. Um, uh, in a, it, it's going to exhaust, the pressure is going to build up in here before it motivates the air to leave as exhaust. So if you have a fan that's pushing the air in, then the exhaust happens, but only because of the pressure differential that this fan is generating between the inside and outside of your structure. Now, if you have a fan at the exhaust that's pulling, then you could balance these two such that this pressure is almost negligible and air would still move, but without that fan, the driving force to get the air to move is that pressurization. All right, so in order to estimate this, it really depends on the building and the design of the building. the building and the equipment within the building. So it relies on the design and operation rather than natural phenomena. So there's two things that can happen. You can assume a value based on prior experience and um, rules of thumb that have been developed over time or if you want to you can actually measure it in practice and use that value. There is no estimate for this because it's not based on a phenomena it's going to be unique to each individual system. All right, And then the last piece that we're going to talk about um, a little bit of just thinking about buildings and how they go together and, and I guess this is um, a little bit of more vocabulary and then a little bit of synthesizing kind of putting the pieces together and thinking about it for different building types. Um, so first thing and you're going to see this in your table so we should talk about what it means um, vestibule. So Any building that you've been in that kind of has two sets of double doors as you go in has a vestibule. Okay, so the idea behind a vestibule is that you reduce the amount of infiltration or exfiltration um, by giving a, a buffer, if you will, an extra buffer between the indoor and outdoor. So if you think in buildings, office buildings, shopping buildings, that sort of thing, um, where you have to go through two sets of double doors. This piece here in between the two double doors is what's called the vestibule. It can be attached onto the outside of a building as they have it drawn here, or it could be inside of a building. Either way, this space between the two sets of doors is um, called the vestibule. So reduces infiltration and 
losses due to foot traffic going through the doors. And then if you don't have a vestibule and you just have one set of doors, this is referred to as a single bank of doors. Okay. Um, so now let's take a look at buildings that we would consider low-rise buildings, so shorter buildings, and the implications of the three types of pressure on infiltration in those buildings. So in low-rise buildings, we're going to, going to see a small stack effect because you need that height in order to build the pressure on the lower uh, lower floors to make it uh, significant um, enough to move volumes of air to have infiltration. Um, and in a uh, low-rise building many times this is just negligible. Um, for the most part when we're in agricultural structures um, this is completely negligible. Um, but because this class covers kind of a wide variety, we're just really about analysis and not about the application to which specific type of uh, facility we're looking at. We want to make sure that we talk about it. Um, so, small, so in low-rise buildings, small stack effect. But you want to make sure that you consider wind effects and, I love this word, crackage. So make sure that we're considering wind effects and crackage. So more butt jokes for sure. I expect to hear those in class. All right. Um, in low-rise buildings, we typically don't see uh, openings that are uniformly distributed on all sides. In your design process. You can think about the orientation of the building if you have that opportunity uh, in terms of implications on infiltration based on the orientation of the building. Um, but it's recommended that um, whenever you're doing your calculations and estimates that you double check what is actually on each side of the building and that you essentially add a little bonus to compensate for what you haven't identified. So you're going to look at all the windows and doors but you're probably not going to uh, go around and, and inspect all of the structure for any uh, aging that it, that might have occurred over time. Um, and usually when you're doing this analysis it's before the, the, the building has even been constructed. So, um, but over time you recognize that you know buildings do settle and uh, cracks do emerge so you're going to want to make sure that you add some additional crack length to compensate for cracks that aren't included in just the doors and windows. Or, over time, the changes in the structure that allow the cracks to be larger. Alright, high-rise buildings. So if we are in a tall building, we expect that the stack effect is going to dominate. Dominant stack effect. Okay. So make sure that you're considering all of your pressure effects, so stack effect and wind effect. Um, And as above, make sure that you're thinking about the leakage and how you're uh, accounting for the cracks.
And the pressure coefficient method that we talked about is uh, typically more feasible to estimate infiltration and exfiltration at each side of the building. So typically when we're looking at uh, these high-rise structures, let me make sure I push that up so you can see it all. When we're looking at high-rise structures and we're looking at stack effects, um, we're looking at wind effects, um, we, we want to look at each side of the building uh, and look at the characteristics of each side of the building separately because each side of the building potentially has some infiltration. Uh, so make sure that when you go through your calculations as you're doing that, that you're not just looking at uh, one side and the other. Make sure you look at all four sides of the building. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to talk about in this chapter um, is not related to heating load based on the structure itself, but heating load based on the delivery of the conditioned air to the space. Okay, so let's take a quick look at heat loss from air ducts. And we did a lab on this, so this should not be um, a new concept to you. Um, and the statement should not be uh, completely foreign to you. Uh, but heat loss from air ducts can be considerable when the ducts are in an unconditioned space. You now know how to calculate those. You could do it for uh, round ducts and for uh, rectangular ducts, I suspect, I expect. We can insulate in order to reduce this heat loss. And we've already seen this, so it's going to be a short discussion but worth having. So remember that you're looking at heat transfer coefficient through the surface um, and so it gets tricky if you're in cylindrical coordinates but you can all handle that now based on the lab we did. Um, let's see. So a couple of potential problems that you want to think about. If you have a circular duct, for example, with insulation on it. When you look at this heat transfer coefficient um, times the surface area, um, so this is insulation, and this is duct. Um, so you're going to have heat transferring through the wall of your duct. So this is going to be your Q dot. And as you notice, the um, as you uh, reduce this heat transfer coefficient. So by adding insulation, you reduce the heat transfer coefficient. But as you're uh, reducing the heat transfer coefficient, you, depending on your insulation, many insulations get thicker and thicker, which actually makes your surface area go up and up. And it's not up linearly, it's up uh, based on circular coordinates. Um, so 
there is a tipping point where your surface area is going up, which makes your heat transfer go up while this is going down. And if, if you're, when you reach that tipping point, your surface area goes up faster than your insulated value increases. And so you actually can lose more heat by putting too much insulation on a circular duct. So you want to be careful about that. Um, you also want to be careful to make sure that um, you are uh, not prone to condensation inside your insulation. So one way to do that is to, let's see, look at, this is your temperature, we're going to say there is a dew point temperature that you don't want to fall below. Um, and this is your inside temperature and your outside temperature in terms of the inside temperature and the outside temperature. And what you want to make sure of is that if at all possible you avoid the condition where your dew point temperature is uh, above, it happens within the wall. So this is happening within the wall of your um, uh, your duct here because if this happens then what it means is you're likely to get condensation inside of your insulation. Um, a few other things that you want to think about considerations um, a few other considerations for your space heating load If you have any other heating sources that are going to be providing heat, you want to make sure to include those uh, so that you then don't oversize your equipment. You might have some special cases uh, that don't fit the mold of what we talked about today, so intermittently heated structures can be a little bit tricky in terms of uh, you know balancing cost and cost of operation with the fact that it's not used very often and if it's intermittently heated then you're going to see big swings in uh, uh, the indoor conditions and possibly uh, big swings in the uh, thermal mass of the building in terms of if you heat it intermittently and you're in a very cold period and you bring it up to the set point but you allow it to come much 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 cooler before you turn it back on again it may you have a lot of lag time in terms of hitting your your set point condition so you want to make sure that you're planning accordingly for that either with the operation or the selection of equipment that can handle those big swings in the amount of time that you want it to happen um, you want to make sure that you're considering uh, what uh, what your supply air is doing. Um, any source media. And a lot of what we're doing in this class really is about developing intuition. Um, rarely would you ever have a scenario very, very specialized scenario, possibly, where you would need to do all of these calculations by hand. At this point, technology has advanced such that there's a lot of tools out there for doing these estimations. Uh, one of them, and there are, like I said, lots, uh, is put out by the Department of Energy. So, let's see, this is more just for if you're interested and you want to go play on it. Uh, kind of fun. DOE.com backslash eQuest. Uh, this is just one option if you want to play around with uh, some some tools, some computational tools that, that can do this for you. Um, so that is going to wrap up our section on Chapter 6 for Space Heating Load. Um, we've tied together, well, we've brought in at least the concepts of the, the previous several chapters uh, into uh, one section talking about, into this section talking, talking about the idea of um, putting those things together in order to be able to size our heating equipment. Um, we will move on to chapter seven next, which we're going to start looking at um, load on the building from solar. So come back soon.